this production of these molecules? What are the overlapping features between information and resolution and homeostasis? And what are the stellar structures that are involved in this process? Then we will be able to mimic it. So you mimic the nature in which the healing occurs and then try to follow it and try to implement it in the patient so that the patient becomes normal and recovers from the disease. So, but these events occur in such a close interaction fashion that there is cooperation, there is collaboration, and both positive and negative regulatory events occur. And they occur in a very timely fashion, sequential fashion, and in a coordinated fashion. And unless there is all these events occur in such a fashion, the health cannot be restored. So there is a saying which I was reading some time back. So whenever you see the facts, then you learn. So what you are, what you are learning in your school, in your college, or in research, is the facts. You are learning the facts, and so you learn them. But if you see the truth, then you start believing it. That means you experiment it, and you see for yourself that is truth, and then you believe it. But if you tell this learning process, these facts, and this uh, truth in the form of a beautiful story, you will remember it forever. That is why there is difference between teacher to teacher. Some teachers can tell you uh, your uh, subject in a very beautiful fashion, and so you never forget it. Some teachers will just tell like a you know, gramophone record, then you will not remember them, because they are not beautiful. They are not so nice to hear. So science is about facts. And so we learn science every day, because there are facts every day in our life. And when you see those facts and believe them, then you will believe them. So, so that is why this is very important. So learning, then seeing the facts, and then uh, seeing the truth, and then remembering it in the form of a story, so that you will remember forever. Then, of course, there is always, you know, people talk about ancient wisdom and so on and so forth. So that, the question that occurred to me is, can ancient wisdom become old or ageless? Can uh, wisdom ever become old? Like we people becoming old sometimes with age and so on and so forth. Can technology become old? So we call it, oh, that is old technology. So my students, when I, they look at my cell phone, they say, this is old technology, you should get a new, new cell phone. But remember that, like, the old technology is necessary for to develop new technology. So unless you remember, you know the old technology, you cannot develop the new technology. So this is very important. So science and technology are forever evolving. Then of course, you also have the spirituality, or what is called the spirit of science. So we, call it, we don't call it a spirituality, we call it a spirit of science, a science of spirit. So science and spirit and spirituality, there is no difference, if you really understand science. Okay, so that is what is very important. Then, of course, this is what I'm showing, showing that how, no, somebody is sitting and polishing his shoes, and instead of doing it with the hands, he's showing it in a machine. So after polishing your shoes with hands, then the machine has come. So polishing the shoes with hand is a old technology, with the machine is a new technology. But hands will never tire, but machine can break down. So I asked my wife, why Ramayana and Bharata are so popular? Why people people believe it? She said, oh, they are epics, they are uh, facts, and so on and so forth. Then I said, they are beautiful stories of uh, facts and uh, truth. And that is why you never forget it. And they are told in a very, very beautiful fashion. So your science learning also should be like that. You learn the facts, you learn the truth, and then learn it in a very in a storytelling fashion then you'll never forget it, and that is why, that is how the students should be taught science. So, that is why this, I like this saying, the, tea, the key to the future of the world is finding the optimistic stories and letting them to be known. So always have optimism that the science can do this, I can do this, and society can do this, and government can do this, then there will be future. Then of course, whenever you develop a new technology, it should not pollute the environment, that is very important then whenever you are in difficulty, you should not feel bad, but try to overcome the bad situation. And then, of course, you should also have happiness. And with happiness will come from science and science of happiness. Then, 
people generally tend to believe that happiness is money and all the physical features you have and so on and so forth. Back in 460 BC, a Democritus, on whose name we call it as democracy, he says, happiness resides not in possessions and not in gold. The feeling of happiness dwells in the soul. That is very important. So you should feel happy that whatever you are doing is good and so on and so forth. And when I talk about this happiness, I always wonder what makes a person happy. Why our neurons become happy when we do something and also. So for a hungry man, if you give food, he becomes happy. That is because the dopamine levels in the brain go up. Dopamine is called as a happy hormone. So and then there is also a disease called as reward deficiency syndrome. Most of the politicians suffer from this. No matter how much reward you give, he is not happy. With 100 crores, 200 crores, 500 crores, they are not happy. So they don't have enough dopamine in their brain. So we should measure the dopamine levels in their plasma and see whether they are happy with what they got or not. So we do these dopamine levels in certain clinical conditions. Like, you know, uh, especially whenever we want to see whether the stimulus that is given to the body is sufficient enough for the resolution process of the wound to occur and so on and so forth. So putting all these facts together, we want to develop drugs. Put all this knowledge together and develop drugs. And uh, developing drugs is not easy. It, take, it is a four or five stage process. So first you have to discover a molecule. And to discover a molecule, you should understand the disease process, the molecular biology of the disease. And then you should develop what are the new insights into the disease. And then see what are exactly is the wrong things that are happening in this disease process. And try to see how you can intervene or how can you can rectify it. Depending upon that, you develop a molecule and see that molecule is working in vitro and then in animal models and then human clinical trials. So whenever you want to do clinical trials, you have to do what is called as preclinical testing, what we call as toxicology studies. If you go to FDA website and look for drugs, there is a column called as drugs that are not effective but not toxic, but they are approved. So FDA will approve any drug as long as it is not toxic, even if it is not effective. Remember that. So the first important thing that FDA looks whenever you file an application is whether it is toxic or not. It is not, they don't, they are not bothered whether it is effective or not. But if it is non-toxic and at the same time effective, that is good. Because then you can catch the market. Then of course after you get all this data and everything, you prepare what is called as investigation new drug application. That is called as IND. So you prepare a, a, a big brochure of about 1,000 pages or 1,500 pages and go to FDA saying that this is our molecule and this molecule is developed based on these facts and this truth, this is the molecular pathway to our works, these are the preclinical toxicology studies and these are the animal studies and the animal studies we have shown the efficacy, non-toxicity and so on and so forth. Then they will review it and then they will give you permission to do clinical trials. So whenever you want to do clinical trials, then you have go through four or five stages, stage one, stage two, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Of course, phase four is only a post-marketing surveillance. Phase three is the most important, where you do double-blind placebo controlled trials. And then, of course, during the trial, you have to do a lot of other investigations, like whether the drug is getting absorbed as predictor or not, what are the plasma levels, what is its metabolism, what is its half-life, whether any tissue specificity is there for the drug or not, whether in which tissue it gets most, mostly concentrated, and if it gets concentrated, how long it is going to stay in the, um, in, the, in the site or not, and so on and so forth. We learned most of these things because we were developing a drug for glioma, brain tumor, and so we went to FDA, and so we had to give them the data about, even though we are injecting into the brain, into the tumor, into directly our drug, the FDA wanted to know whether the drug is going to spill over from the brain into the peripheral circulation. We know that it doesn't come out, but still they said you have to measure it in the plasma and show that there are no changes in the plasma levels of the drug before and after injection into the tumor. So we have done that. Then of course they want to know how much drug is there in the tumor, how much drug is there surrounding the tumor, and how, what are the metabolites that are formed, whether those metabolites are present in the plasma, and if though they are coming into the urine or not. So no matter where you inject your drug, the FDA wants all this data and you have to produce it and show them. And FDA is also not bothered to some extent if there are side effects. Because there is no drug which is not without side effects, depending upon the dose. 
the duration of uh, treatment that is given and so on and so forth. As long as you identify the side effects and warn the patient and you know what to do when the side effects occur. So it may be dose dependent, it may be time dependent, it may be metabolite dependent and so on and so forth. So you should know what all those things. So once all this data is done and then you go to the okay. <laughs> go to the FDA and say that uh, no, uh, we, we, we file what is called as new drug application and then do it. For example, we are now developing certain essential oils as a drugs and so we are going through all these things. Then, uh, so the advice is that follow the nature and mimic the nature. Nature is nothing but our body. So that is how beta blockers and H2 blockers have been developed. And then I want to talk very briefly about diet and exercise, which people have been talking about it. We know that with the diet restriction, you can prolong the life, even including the human life by 20 to 30 percent. That's why one of the advices that is given to most of the patients is you eat less. You cut down your calorie intake by 20 to 30 percent, so you live longer by 20 to 30 percent. When you eat food, you generate a lot of free radicals. And these free radicals, when they are excess, they are harmful. Whereas when you drink water, there are no free radicals developed by this uh, slide. And uh, if you, whatever food you take, you generate free radicals. So that means food itself is toxic, but we have to eat food. So it has to be eat, eaten within normal limits. For example, we had a patient who had a 350 LBs weight. He came to the hospital saying that I want to lose weight. We told him don't eat any food. So he did not eat any food literally for one year. He took only water and vitamins and minerals. And after one year, he lost 100 and LBs. In all this one year, he went to the office and worked. So if you stop eating food for two, three days, you are not going to die or anything. But people are afraid to miss breakfast and lunch. Okay. And then, of course, we showed that whenever you do exercise, you suppress production of free radicals, and it is anti-inflammatory in nature. So that is why... So uh, in fact, we have shown that whenever you do exercise, you enhance the activity of two enzymes called as desaturases. They le lead to the generation of a comp compound called as lipoxin A4, which is a potent anti-inflammatory molecule. So how much exercise do you have to do? So we generally recommend people to do 5,000 steps per day. But if you can somebody do up to 20, 30,000 steps per day, that is very good. And then, of course, whenever you do exercise, you improve your memory. So this is an experiment we have done in the animals where we have shown that the sedentary life up, up, uh, in the upper board, right? the lower room, when you do exercise, the number of neurons and the synapses are increased, so you better memory. So we tell nowadays to all our students not to study one week before the exams. Do exercise, eat less food, and be relaxed, and you write well in the exams. Then, of course, whenever you do exercise, you generate a lot of molecules called as BDNF, lipoxin A4, nitric oxide, and so on and so forth. So we measure these molecules, including cytokines, IL-16, and alpha in the plasma, to know whether the exercise done is adequate or not. So if there's changes in the levels of these molecules, then we know that the exercise that is done by the person is adequate. If they are not up to the mark, then we tell them that you have to do more exercise so that the molecular levels are increased. Then, of course, we have developed two molecules called as DH and EAA, which can improve memory. And so we are now making it into capsules and then we are trying. So what are the three advances that have occurred in the last one month? So you can develop, yeah, we have, we have, people have developed what is called as a biodome. This contains five molecules and you take a frog, cut off its limb, and then put this biodome on the, uh, on the limb that is left after cutting. And in one year, it, the limb regrows completely including bone, blood vessels, nervous system, everything. So you can see that actually there, all right, the last fourth one. Okay, so that means now we have the technology to regenerate tissues, including limbs, fingers, liver, uh, 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 kidney, especially liver, and so on and so forth. In in we are trying it for a heart. So that means you can probably use the te same technology and same molecules to regenerate brain also to limited extent. Then this is the slide showing that you no, know, well, the limb has regenerated and com became completely normal. Then, of course, a, a, an adhesive type of ultrasound is being developed, which contains three or four layers of uh, adhesion molecule, uh, adhesion uh, 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 tissue. You can put it in the stomach, and it continuously monitors the internal organs. And then you can see what is happening to the your heart, your liver, spleen, or splanchnic circulation, or elementary canal, whatever it is. 
and uh, you can put it any, anywhere in the body. It is just like a thin layer of film. You can put it, so ultrasound, so if in future we don't have ultrasound uh, machines, you can put this layer and then it will uh, uh, take the ultrasound of all the features. Then of course, we, another thing is how to improve memory. The most memory, the, mo the most important structure in the body that has memory is DNA. So now computer scientists are trying to develop DNA as a memory chip. So you take a synthetic DNA, inject into the cell, it will go and integrate it into the cell DNA and then it will continuously monitor the cell, cell functions and then it memorizes it, keeps it in memory and if you can re uh, retract that memory and use it when the cell becomes sick. So because by looking at that uh, DNA memory, you know where, where and when it has, under, it has, it has gone and it has changed. And so you can go back to that uh, situation and then uh, uh, repair the process and so the memory can be re reborn. So this can be used for the cell memory, it can be used for tissue memory, for organ memory and for brain memory. Thank you very much. Any question from the audience? I have skipped some uh, slides, but you should uh, pardon me for that. Thank you so much, sir, for igniting our mental horizons. I realize is a true scientist spirit in you. I wish your wisdomful words and the talks will right. always be available with us. Thank you so much, sir. Ekbar Jordar Kartal Dhwani se swagat kijiye. Thank you. धन्यवाद ज्ञापित कीजिए डॉक्टर यू एन दास जी का जिन्होंने एक इतने अच्छे नोवल कॉन्सेप्ट पे हमें जानकारी दी कार्यक्रम की श्रृंखला को आगे बढ़ाते हुए मैं मंच पर आमंत्रित करती हूँ प्रोफेसर राखी चतुर्वेदी जी का शी इज द प्रोफेसर एंड हेड एट द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो साइंसेज एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग आई गुवाहाटी She is a visiting professor in Jifu University, Japan, and is a recipient of Professor F. C. Stewart Memorial Award 2021. Along with that, she is a member of National Academy of Sciences, as well as Plant Tissue Culture Association, and many more. I welcome you, ma'am, and I'm sure that your wisdomful words will be very beneficial to our budding scientists. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, and first of all, I wish to uh, thank the organizers and uh, the Patanjali uh, entire team who have invited me to share my views and ideas and then the, my research. Uh, particularly, I wish to thank Acharji and uh, Swami Ramdevji uh, who have, I mean, entering into the Patanjali itself is, is a very positive aura I felt. Um, I also wish uh, very happy birthday and uh, wish you very, very happy long life and very happy, healthy long life to Acharya Ji, whose birthday is coming. Uh, so with this, um, I think, let me come back to my topic here, um, which uh, I wanted to share with you. There are the two things here. Uh, uh, you may see this plant tissue culture and metabolite production. Um, then we are talking about the sustainability. So sustainability of metabolite production, metabolite means uh, what we are using for, uh, since for the last two days we are talking about the Ayurvedic medicines and we know all is what we are talking about, the plant-based. And think about if we continuously using these plants from the field, what will happen to the plant vegetation? It may go on extinction, it may, you, I mean, it may deplete. So there has to be an alternative solution. When we are using something, there has to be a replacement as well. So here the tissue culture technique has come up as a rescue uh, to uh, come up as a compensation of the plants which we are using and side by side as an alternative method to provide the raw material for large scale, commercial scale production of the metabolites. And that's what about the sustainability. Um, the, uh, this is the first, uh, the tissue culture concept came. Uh, see, when we, have, when we are getting, con because a lot of students are here, and I wish, wish to address more to the students, because this is something fascinating. And 
most importantly, when you are using the technology, one should know the know-how of what is what, the basics. And uh, the plant system, you have, uh, most of you have, us have taught, been taught the botany, which is talking about the classical botany. So when you are implementing the technology, one should know about the each and every part of the plant system, then the technology work well. Suppose if your vehicle got uh, damage or puncture, if you don't know where to what to fix it, what the role of which part, it's very difficult to fix it. So the same is applying to the plant system and when you are confused with the plant system, just think about yourself. Because both are the eukaryotic system, they feel, they sense and they, the more they are looking, taking care of it, they will uh, uh, flourish. So based on this, the first concept of this totipotency has come up from uh, Dr. Frederick Stewart and it was an accidental discovery when he has cut the sections of the carrot, carrot gajar, uh, sections of the carrot in a nutrient medium and then he found the cells are dividing and they give rise to the embryo. Embryo is a seed. In a layman terms, we call it as the kernel which is present inside the hard seed coat. This aam ki gutli ke andar jo soft part hota hai, kernel kehlata hai. So we get the embryo without the hard coat in the tissue culture system. So this concept came uh, uh, from the cells, that cells are totally potent. That means each and every cell of the plant system has the capacity to regenerate the lost organ or the entire plant system. So that's the beauty of the entire plant system. So with this concept, you think about, you see here, the lot of techniques are available. But again, this is a lot of when the lot, lot many options are available is equal to no options because confusion starts. So what I hear is alert is, uh, this technology is available, but where has to be implemented, what actually is needed in the plant system is very, very important. Because right now, the tissue culture in most of the cases is a, uh, you see the failure majorly because it has been arbitrarily used without understanding what is exactly needed in the plant system. So the moment we know what is required in the plant system, then the, accordingly the technique will be picked up. So here I will entire my talk, what we do the research is, we are not using any foreign DNA element, we are using the existing plant machinery of the same plant and using it in the best way to meet the demand or improvement in the plant system. So these are some of the plant system which we use is, um, this is the first on the top, corner, left corner. This is the tea. Uh, we are very familiar. Every day we take this beverage. Uh, if you see, uh, uh, there are only three parents, actual parents of the tea. And one is Camellia assamica, which is grown in the Assam region of the India, in the Northeast region. Other is Camellia sinensis. And the third one is, again, the lineage of Assam, Camellia assamica subspecies Lesiocalyx. But today's there are a lot many species are available, 320, 325 plus, just because it is aggressively crossbreed. And as a result, in the nature, none of the pure breed types are available. So this is the concern. What is impure is adult rents because it's a cross-pollinating and some other species, pollen grains are fertilizing. And the seeds, propagation is by the seeds and it's all mixed up. So here we work on the tree species. Uh, the, we work on some plants, but these are the representative. Just wanted to tell uh, you all that we work on the tree species, which is really challenging because in nature, the trees grow, grow, uh, grow slow and same reflection is there in the in vitro system. So one has to be a little more patient. Grasses grow very fast in the nature. So the, in the tissue culture system, we get the same response in one week for the grasses, but for the trees, it takes two months to get, complete the one single experiment. And lot many experiments are to be done to come up to the conclusion point. So we work on the tree species. Another is the, our own plant as a reactor indica. And when we talk about, everybody says we are very much familiar of it. But unfortunate part of it is, is still if you buy the as a directin, which is the main component of this neem, there's only one species, as a directa indica. And if you see the literature, it has come from Azad Arakht. Azad Erecta is Azad Erect is the name. Uh, the unfortunate part is, uh, if we are going to purchase the Azad Erectin, 500 milligram comes in around 5,000 rupees still. While we say the plant is growing in our courtyard everywhere, but that's not the fact. 
it doesn't grow in the cold climate. It likes the, uh, the very warm temperature, 45 plus. If you go to the southern part of India, it flourishes. So here we are working on these two tree species to come up with the pure, the paste is used, and it, in fact, it is also repel the insects. The Tinospora uh, cordifolia, everybody knows about the Giloy, immuni, immunity improvement, it favors. Other than this, it has the anti-diabetic compound. So these are some of the plants. So the trees, the shrubs, herbs, and woody climbers. We work on all these aspects. And we divide our work into three major, as and when the request comes. One is the quantitative improvement. That means we need the large scale propagation of identical plants which are identical to the parent. You don't have to recheck, recross verify. It may be, it will be the clones of the parent plant. The second is the qualitative, where we have the parent plant, but we need certain improvement. Then we go accordingly and metabolite production. So this is under the qualitative improvement, quantitative improvement. Uh, this is the entire plant body is here. The cursor is not working, but you may please try to understand. The top part is the shoot tip, uh, the tip region, which is known for the two concepts. One, generating the identical plants and also the virus-free plants. Uh, why virus-free plants? Normally virus is percolating from roots to the up through the conducting strand. It's like a pipeline is taking the water from to your home. So here in this tip part, the uh, virus is not reaching because vascular tissue is not there. So this particular part, if utilized, it can generate the disease-free, particularly the virus-free plants. And if rest of the plant, nodal segments, if utilized, it can generate the, exactly the clones of the parent plant. So in the, what is happening in the nature, what is conventionally happened, we are mimicking some of them in the tissue culture with a little faster speed, where lakhs of the plants can be produced. So the nodal segment, if you see the, the gardener uh, chop, chops the, uh, the twigs of the plant and it grows into the hedge. Jhadi ki tarah se grow karta hai, if agar hum tip part ko cut karte jate hai, trimming karte hai. So the same concept was taken, but in the conventional method, you need the big twigs to, like vegetative cuttings and rose cuttings, you need 16, 30 centimeter long cutting and give rise to one plant, that too in the favorable season. So here we are irrespective of whatever the season outside, we take the single node, one centimeter node cutting and give rise to the, it gives several plants. Overall propagation system is divided into two. One is the challenge is to get the shoot proliferation. So here the challenge is what X plant, part of the plant is to be taken. And that will be decided what exactly needed in the plant. The sh second is the shoot elongation. The moment you have the shoot, it is to be elongated sufficiently so that it can be placed into the rooting medium. So that the roots develop from the base of the shoot. And finally, the hardening, because everything is happening under the control condition of 25 degree temperature and 100% humidity, 16 hour light, 8 hours dark. So here, suddenly if we transfer this into the light or the natural condition, the plant will not survive. So it's a gradual process, a week to two months. It's simply if we are sitting in the air conditioned room here, suddenly if you go in a chill heat, uh, we, some of them will collapse or started sweating. So it's always a gradual process for the plant as well. Uh, so this is the one method. Uh, here the cutting, you see the corner, left corner. This is the, the X plant we use after chopping the leaves. And the shoot is growing from that particular position which is pre-existing in the nature. Only we are improving the efficiency while providing the nutrient medium and entire shoot is developed and then the root plant, complete plantlet is ready in the last picture here and then finally it is hardened. The second, this is the, um, from the same nodal segment, we have generated the root biomass because root is another, another storage organ for the metabolites. So in plant system, there are three uh, point of origin where the concentration is very highly, present, high amount is present in, of metabolites is the roots, the leaves and the embryos. So it does not mean it doesn't have in rest of the plant body. It is present, but we target the concentrated amount where it is present. And that's a little uh, strategically taking, plucking the part of the plant for metabolites. Uh, so this is the root biomass we have generated. 
The, this is the stevia where again we have used the axillary shoot which we were supplying to the farmers every uh, 12,000 plants per week. Uh, our MTech student was doing it just to help them to grow them large scale propagation because here the leaves are to be utilized for stevial glycoside production as a raw material. Uh, this is the banana uh, where we are using the shoot tip because banana have a lot of problem with the viruses. So here we are using the shoot tip. Normally the plants grow through the sucker and from one shoot tip you can get only one plant conventionally. So here we can see the picture four. You can get multiple shoots from the single uh, tip portion. This is the leaf part. We made a disc, so like, I mean it's the designing of the explant. Otherwise it can be used the chopping of the leaves. And if the right formulation is added into the nutrient medium, they also develop the large number of the shoots. The number can be increased. The, this is about the embryos. Is, is like a seed without the seed coat, hard seed coat. So they also are like a bipolar. When you sow them, how, how you get the plant? When you sow the seeds, the complete plantlet is developed. The same here. When you sow them, entire plantlet is developed. So here one cycle is reduced in when you get the shoot it is to be transferred to the root and then the plantlet. Here we are directly moving to the plantlet because this embryo is bipolar so it is a little more faster and it is produced from single cell so it's the clones of even the cell system and large scale propagation can be done. The synthetic seed is produced, nothing is synthetic except the coating. Inside what you see the green color is actually an embryo is coated with the in the gel and to for the storage purpose and when it is sown into the soil it gives rise to the entire plantlet but before we do we make ensure that embryo should be germinating this is the callus is more resembling like a cancerous growth in the human system which is nobody likes it but in the plant system it has two way advantage if you see the upper part is the green color which give rise to the shoots and this is known for generating the variations because they divide similar fashion like a cancerous cell uncontrolled mass of cell division. If we add the side right formulation it will give rise to the shoots. The brown color callus is a substitute for the raw material like a cell biomass for metabolite production. So the favorite I mean the, the important point here is uh, here the un small unit of the cells are present and that will help to get the efficient metabolite production because when you are adding the solvent it percolates into each and individual cell and withdraws the metabolite. Otherwise in the if you collect the plant material from the nature it has to be chopped but even after chopping one cannot get the fine uh, uh, bunch of the tissues or the cells. This is the qualitative improvement where we have worked on the tree species because trees, uh, the bigger challenge for the farmers is in the breeding program, they grow very slow. Suppose if you have planted a mango uh, plant, it will, uh, the reproductive phase comes in three to five, week, uh, five years. That means you will get the fruits after five years and the flowering as well. So the farmers have to wait for five years to get the flowers so that control pollination or manipulation can be done again has to wait for the seed to be sown and then in this way six to seven generation has to be crossed to confirm is what the traits have been wanting it is permanent because it is percolating from generation to generation by the time it will come it is 30 35 years counting that average is five years for the reproductive phase that's too much cumbersome and by the time we may forget also what we wanted in the plant. So with this concept, the tissue culture is providing a help. Here the inside, this is the flower structure and this is a, comp a shoe flower, hibiscus, uh, it's called good health. The anther inside the anther is a uninucleate, pollen grains are present and if we get the plants from them, they will be N, half of the, they are like, uh, they are gametes and which are actually meant for fertilization, but we get the plants from them. So similarly, the egg cell also serves the same purpose. The endosperm cell has a 3N nucleus, very nutritious, like coconut milk is a 3N. If we get the plants from them, it will be seedless plant. So this technology has already been implemented in some of the 
the watermelon, the tarbuj, which you find. Wherever the seeds are obstruction, the endosperms are grown. Good. So this is the method we use for anthoculture. Um, where you see the inside, uh, numerous pollen grains are there. They are the male gamete, which is male, meant for the fertilization. But what we do is, when they're very young, we divert there, we give them the stress in a way, they start producing the plants rather than participating into the fertilization. So here the stage is very, very important. It should be very young stage. It's like, it's very easy to change the mind of the toddler than the mature person. So the same implement, we implement the, the idea. This is the embryos. Uh, large scale propagation happens when we use the pollen grain in case of tea. And they mimic the same stages like a natural embryo from globular, torpedo, to, globular heart, torpedo, and then the dicot stage. They germinate like a natural embryo. Right now they are haploid. We made them, treat them, this plant, with a colchicine, again a plant based product. And it doesn't do any, create any abnormality, only it hit the spindle, which is move, meant for pulling apart the chromosome. So when the spindle is broken, the chromosome does not move apart. They remain in the, they get separated, chromatids, but remain in the same cell and it get doubled. So it's called doubled haploid, so that they normally participate in a fertilization process and bears the seeds. Otherwise, haploids plant will also grow very, I mean, very, uh, normally like a parent plant, but they will not bear the seeds. So if we want a seed, it has to be doubled. So this is the neem uh, nimoli. If you see, there are only one species, but it's still a lot of variation. Why? The same happens with the mango also. Why? Because it is cross-pollinating and unknown pollen decide the quality of the seeds. So suppose if we are interested in, this is the parent plant, and this is the bigger size of the nimoli, and we want some clones of it, we can implement the technology. If we want the pure breed types, we can target the pollen grains or the egg cell. Uh, why we are targeting the nimoli talking about? Because embryo inside is known for all medicinal properties, maximum. In fact, it is used as a biodegradable biopesticide. It degrades on its own in the nature. So this is the, on the left side is the culture room and where we are growing after inoculating the explant under the control condition. And once we get the results, and hardening process done in the next right side picture is for the, the greenhouse, where a large number, once they survive in the greenhouse, they can be transferred to the field condition. So this is normally it is growing in the field, and some changes you see in the lower part, there's three leaves are there. The uh, center one is the natural plant, a small leaf, but sideways, you see the haploid plant, bigger size of the leaf. So what is happening generally, Diploid have a larger leaf, haploid have a smaller leaf, and triploid has even larger leaf, but here the reverse is happening. The reason is, in diploid, the, there is a dominant and recessive chromosomes are present. Dominant is always dominant, and recessive never get expressed. So what happens when we develop the plants from the haploid, both get separately, independently, are happily expressing itself. And probably, this larger size of the leaf could be a recessive character could not get expressed in the cross-pollinating plant. So uh, this is the third which have idea. What we do is, once we have a callus, it can be directly processed as a cell biomass, or further fine suspension can be pre prepared in a liquid a medium where there is no agar. And the rest of the technology is what the chemists follow, is solvent ex ex extraction, then lyophilization, or uh, I mean vacuum evaporator, the solvent get evaporated, then TLC is a quick check checking, then HPLC, NMR, and all to find out the known or unknown compound. It's quite, it's all technology is well standardized, only we have to rightly implement into the plant system. That's what takes time. It's all about the research. So this was the case study, uh, case of Lentana. Uh, actually, it is an obnoxious wheat. Uh, in most of the part of the UP, it, uh, because it's difficult to uproot it. So somewhere, in, uh, in the western UP, some lightweight furnitures are prepared. In the northeast, people are using it for the twigs to heal the tooth cavity. So with that idea, we started working on uh, this plant. And we utilize the flower, the leaf. Uh, this is the leaf disc from where we get the callus. This is the stem part because twigs were used. So we thought something might be there in the stem. The callus is produced, and this is the leaf and the flower. 
and all of them were producing the compound and there were the, this is the flow chart so here these are the target the leaves the stem roots and the seeds so this is the callus because medicinal compounds normally have a lot of phenolics the browning and it's a defense mechanism for them whenever they get wounded they first try to cover the heal the wound like what we do so in this process they release the phenolic compounds uh, but tissue culture is they don't like it because it's a it's an inhibition for fast division of the cells so first challenge was to remove the browning of this callus so we started fast multiplying and at the end we got the very fresh friable green color texture of the callus and that's the right texture for processing for metabolites we followed all this technique of purification and reconformation cross conformation what compounds are present and some fine tuning can also be done the moment we know which stage how many time it uh, how many days it takes for fast multiplication of the cells because the plant cells they grow slow compared to the bacteria because bacteria they grow in just four four uh, they grow in just four hours as well and that's what we have been asked to brush your teeth after having food at night but for plants it takes a week or uh, 25 uh, 21 days 3 weeks so the moment we know which part of the day, uh, the growth cycle have the fast multiplication and the fine tuning can be done at this stage while incorporating some bacterial spores or some foreign dna i mean or their products because moment the fungal spores or their products are added the cells started taking it as a defense mechanism and they start producing the metabolites which are using it as a common uh, for medicinal purpose otherwise they do not pre exist all these medicinal metabolites normally uh, when the plant get stressed up senses something attack has been happened and then it started producing so thinking about this we started implementing this the commercialized scale of uh, production of the cell biomass can done in the reactors 3 3 liter to we can grow slowly to 5 liter to 10 and then 100 liter reactors so with this procedure we found there were three compounds were there and these are the three compounds they were pentacyclic triterpenoids they were very difficult to synthesize is a long chain carbon molecules chemists find it very difficult so, to synthesize so alternative is to get the cell biomass so here these uh, olinolic acid and um, uh, arsolic acid they were the isomers and the betulinic acid and all three were present in the same cell system while compared to this parents have only olinolic and arsolic acids so this uh, we have tested on the hela cell lines and found the anti cancerous activity but the cells originating from the stem have the had the anti microbial activity on it uh, so thank you very much uh, this is the it guwahati campus and any queries thank you so much ma'am your nice talk on plant tissue culture and its advancement is really very informative i thank you on the behalf of whole potentially family thank you so much zordar karta dhvaniyon se aap abhinandan kijiye respected ma'am ka कार्यक्रम की श्रृंखला को आगे बढ़ाते हुए हम आगे इनवाइट करते हैं डॉक्टर के राजामणि जी को ही इज अ प्रोफेसर एंड हेड ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ फ्लोरिकल्चर एंड लैंडस्केप आर्किटेक्चर तमिलनाडु एग्रीकल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी तमिलनाडु ही हैज एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ 34 फोर ईयर्स इन मेडिसिनल प्लांट रिसर्च एंड हैंडल्ड मोर देन ट्वेंटी एक्सटर्नली फंडेड प्रोजेक्ट एंड इन विच फिफ्टीन आर एन एम रिसर्च प्रोजेक्ट I welcome you sir on the dais for the presentation. Uh revered uh, acharya ji uh all the esteemed uh, guest I would like to thank for this uh, good opportunity given to me for uh, being here and I should uh, thank uh, the PRA uh and uh, Dr GP Rao uh, GP Rao for uh, making this possible. so this is really a wonderful uh, institute which i witnessed uh, day before uh, when i landed here uh, i was amazed uh, to see this institute 
I've heard about uh, the Padanjali University. Dr. G. P. Rao used to share with me. You must see the university. So kindly make it convenient to uh, come over uh, for this international conference. So with that message, uh, I came. Uh, astonishing, I would say. And it, it was just reminding me uh, when I visited uh, Shanghai in Shanghai and Beijing in 2018. So that visit for uh, purely meant for uh, studying the TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. So those facilities, uh, I was just imagining when uh, this kind of uh, the infrastructure and uh, the scientific laboratory will come in India. So we know how Ayush is uh, very important to us. Last 30, 33 years I've been working in this field. And uh, when I entered the Badanjali, really glorifying institute, I would uh, really uh, compliment the uh, Swamiji and uh, Chariji for uh, building this great institute to this level. And uh, I would say this institute is really the propeller, propeller for the Ayush uh, sector. So when Ayush uh, is competing with uh, the TCM, and uh, this kind of